Thank you very much. I will be uh, including a, a text here just in a few moments, so if it would be acceptable to do that at that time, that would be uh, a best for me. I must confess that I come before you uh, trembling this morning. Um, it would be significantly less stressful for me to uh, have you all in full hijab and Arabic clothing, and I would be standing before you to proclaim that Muhammad was not a prophet uh, than it is uh, for me to address this particular subject uh, in light of the fact that I know that a number of the uh, men in front of me uh, have intimate personal knowledge of developments over the past number of years at Westminster Seminary and particularly with Dr. Peter Enns. And so I guess there is one advantage to living in Phoenix, Arizona and being involved in apologetics, uh, and that is I get to come at this from a perspective, hopefully, that is somewhat dispassionate in the sense that it is not personally driven. Whereas in discussing Dr. Ehrman, I have encountered Dr. Ehrman and um, you have an individual there who uh, clearly does not even proclaim any longer any Christian faith. We have a very different situation here. And so my hope this morning uh, in addressing some of the major issues that have been raised about the subject of inerrancy uh, by Dr. N's book uh, is to do so, first of all, by positively looking at, again, key issues in regards to what it means to believe in inerrancy key issues in regards to what is happening within the academy, as it is broadly called, within quote-unquote Christian education as it exists in the West, uh, and then to look specifically at some of the issues raised in regards to Old Testament and New Testament interpretation, and to try to once again encourage believers to not be, in essence, coward by the look of the world that says to you that if you utter that, that the I word, the inerrancy word, or any more even the inspiration word, that you are cutting your theological throat, uh, that you are making yourself irrelevant, that you no longer have anything to say to the culture, my hope would be to say to you that that is not only untrue, but it is fundamentally irrational. Uh, you may recall the night before last, Dr. Murray, at one point in his exposition of Peter's description of the very means by which the scriptures come to us, that men spoke from God as they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. As far as I can tell, one of the, one of the most in-depth descriptions in inspired scripture as to how it is that God has brought this miraculous revelation to us. You may recall that at one point he made a statement uh, he pointed out that it is simply logical to recognize that inerrancy flows from a recognition that God has spoken. How else would God speak? It is a logical construct. It is irrational to me. And I, due to family, church, and ministry situations, uh, did my first master's degree through Fuller Theological Seminary. Please do not throw the hymnals at me right now. Thank you. <laughs> It turned out to be for my betterment, given that I'm involved in apologetics, uh, to have had to engage in years of it in seminary, uh, so as to be prepared to do so. But uh, in my experience there, I learned firsthand what it is like to be looked upon as if you have an extra head growing out of your shoulders, because you actually believe things such as inerrancy. I remember very clearly in a New Testament class after the professor had just documented the decline of the seminary's view. We were looking at 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Uh, after talking about how the seminary had backed away from a position it had once held, uh, I stuck my hand up in the air and I expressed the frustration that would exist for, for any conservative student who would believe that God has spoken in such a way that he is consistent with himself. He doesn't have to use the same people and the same words, but that there is a spirit-born consistency that exists in the Word of God that's a beautiful thing, and yet, in essence, we were being told we could not even look for that. To even think that it might be there, to even take the first step down the road to searching for that, we were being told was, in essence, the end of our academic career. 
And after expressing for about five or six minutes, and at least I must give them this credit, in the 1980s, um, I was allowed freedom to be who I was uh, in that seminary program without penalty. I don't think that would be the case any longer. But as long as you demonstrated that you were listening and you were interacting with what was being said, I never experienced any uh, penalization of my grading or scoring or anything like that. Um, one time we were asked to review a book, uh, a, a commentary on Deuteronomy by uh, Gerhard von Rott. And uh, I remember reading it very carefully and marking it. I was a, a diligent student. But we were supposed to mention the positives and the negatives as a part of our review. And my positive section went exactly like this. This book has a wonderful binding. <laughs> and now on to the negatives. Um, and uh, I got a 98 on the review because in providing the negatives, I demonstrated that I had not only listened, I had listened with understanding. Uh, that seems to be how conservatives handle liberals. That's not how liberals handle conservatives in my experience in any way, shape, or form. So I've been there. I understand. And I understand what it is for you to be theological students, those of you who are students. You are in a situation where you have godly men leading you, and they are telling you these things. But you know, because you do study the other side, and you do know what's out there, you know the pressure that's going to be brought to bear upon you when you're outside of this context to compromise on these issues. Because if you believe in inerrancy, well, you're just making the evangelical faith irrelevant for our modern day. And that's a very serious charge. And I think the fact that we've taken the time to address the issue so fully over the course of this conference demonstrates that we take that charge seriously and believe that there is an answer for it. But our people need to understand that as well. And we need to encourage each other in this matter. Most of you know that in 1978, a group of evangelicals came together and produced a document on inerrancy. And the summary statements sort of went along these lines. God, who is himself truth and speaks truth only, has inspired Holy Scripture in order thereby to reveal himself to lost mankind through Jesus Christ as creator and Lord, redeemer and judge. Holy Scripture is God's witness to himself. Holy Scripture being God's own word, written by men prepared and superintended by his spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises. The Holy Spirit, Scripture's divine author, both authenticates it to us by his inward witness and opens our minds to understand its meaning. Please note that phrase. I'm going to expand upon it in a moment because I believe it is frequently missed. Let me repeat it. That spirit opens our minds to understand its meaning. Being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less in what it states about God's acts and creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God, than in its witness to God's saving grace in individual lives. The authority of Scripture is inescapably impaired if this total divine inerrancy is in any way limited or disregarded or made relative to a view of truth contrary to the Bible's own, and such lapses bring serious loss to both the individual and the church. I am an apologist. I try to take our faith as consistently as I can to those who seek to deny it. Over the past few years, I've done so in the context, especially of Islam. And I was not joking when I spoke of standing before audiences as large as this, where many of the women are in full hijab. All you can see are their eyes. And men are wearing the kufi and the Islamic dress. And I have stood before them to proclaim to them that Jesus Christ is not just a Rasul, but that he is truly their creator. And that they cannot... Be neutral about him. Every breath they take comes from his hand. Every beat of their heart is under his sovereignty. And therefore they must deal with him. How can I make that assertion if I do not have a sure word upon which to ground my proclamation? And it strikes me that as Christianity seeks to face the world's religions in a way it's never had to do before because we've never had an internet. Just as we the, the printing press changed culture in tremendous ways. The internet has done so even more. 
I was just listening to Dr. Piper, and he mentioned a book by Dr. Knight that I don't have. And so while Dr. Piper was speaking, I decided to find out if the book was still available. And I was able to find out within about two paragraphs of his presentation whether I could get hold of that book because I, you know, that's something I need to do more reading on. That kind of soaking of information into us is all around us. And so Christianity has to face religions that used to be way out there, now they're right next to us. And upon what basis can we meaningfully proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord if we no longer have a word that we can trust from him? That is why so much of the proclamation that we find in the world today has become anemic. It has become, well, I feel this. Well, I'm glad you feel that way, but your feelings cannot determine my eternal fate. I want to hear from the Lord. I want to have an ambassador from the Lord who can say, thus says the Lord. And if we don't have the scriptures as God's spoken word to us today, we only have the opinions of men. And that does not accomplish much today. I'm so thankful for what Dr. Murray said about 2 Peter chapter 1 and its assertion that what we possess today does not find its origin merely in the thoughts of man. And this is going to be important as we talk about Dr. N's theories about the incarnational view of Scripture. Because when we actually look at what Scripture says about itself, its direct assertions are that Scripture never had its origin in the human will, but men spoke from God as they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. And as we consider what that means, where would the Holy Spirit carry those writers? What they're speaking comes from God. Yes, they use their words, their speech. The doctor was just talking about the fact that when we look at the book of Hebrews, and I, I'm preaching through the book of Hebrews in my church right now, and as any of you know who've done that, uh, that is tough sledding. That's hard work, and that's what I enjoy about it. But I can guarantee you that no one has ever used Hebrews as a first-year Greek text. Not if they want anybody to pass, anyways. <laughs> Anyone who has read 1 John and then flips a page over to Hebrews, can you remember what it was like to be a first-year Greek student? Hey, 1 John, I'm, I'm doing pretty good here. I'm, I'm, that's a genitive right there, you know? And, and I was, I was <laughs> Brother Brett has been my, my host while I've been here, and I very much appreciate the, the friendship that we've developed. And uh, he, he, he was very proud at one point during a conversation. He said, that's a genitive. I said, you're right. But I hate to tell you something, brother. Next year you find out there's at least 12 kinds of them, too. <laughs> And his face hung, and oh, no, man. I'm not even including the ablative idea there, too. So it's, it's wonderful. But don't want to discourage any of you. You press on in, in your studies there. But uh, the, the point is they, they might move, you know, just move a few pages over and start. Well, let's look at something in Hebrews here. What language is that again? <laughs> it doesn't even look like First John. It's tough stuff. In other words, God has not just, as Dr. Murray pointed out, dictated this. It doesn't have just one language. It has different styles, and clearly, as we look at the broad sweep of Revelation in the Old Testament, we likewise see people coming from different time periods and all these things, and yet it is our assertion that the harmony that exists in Scripture is not some surface-level simplistic harmony that you would get by looking at the printer documents for the new printer you bought for your computer. It better be harmonious. Only one person wrote the documents for it. And hopefully he did it in English. If you've read some of them, sometimes you question that. It is a harmony that comes over 1,500 years, and it must be divine. It must have its origin in God. When we consider what the scriptures say, in, for example, in the text in 2 Peter, in the act of speaking, these men are giving to us what God would have us to know and what God would have his church to have. And I cannot forget the words of the Lord Jesus in the encounter that he has with the disciples after his resurrection. Think of these words, and if you wish to look at a text today, let's look at Luke chapter 24, just briefly as I move to Dr. N's presentation. I think this is one of the primary issues that is lost in fact, it's not even allowed in many areas in the discussion of whether inerrancy is something we should even be concerned about or whether we are just simply stuck in a dogmatic quagmire 
and we are traditionalists, hidebound to just repeat what pre preceding generations have said. That's the accusation that's made against us. We need to know what the accusations are if we're going to respond to them properly. People are saying, look, you folks are just going with what preceding generations that didn't know what we know have said. You're protecting your property. You're protecting the area you've carved out. And you're not really being truthful. And for me, when someone says I'm not being truthful, that's a pretty serious charge. When Jesus meets with the disciples, Luke chapter 24 Verse 44, now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. Now, these are men who have walked with the incarnate Lord for quite a period of time. Words of graciousness, sinless words of love for God have flowed from his lips. They have heard him teach more than anyone else has heard him teach. They've heard his illustrations, and I would imagine he used the same illustrations multiple times. They knew the teaching of Jesus Christ. And yet, upon his resurrection, what must he do? He must open their understanding. Something supernatural is going on here. Something supernatural is happening here. He opens their minds to understand the scriptures. I have become convinced over the years that part and parcel of the work of the Spirit of God in regenerating the heart is to implant in that heart a desire to hear, know, and obey the Word of God. Those of you who function as elders in the church, you know the people I'm about to describe to you. It is as if God has given us this entire room as the borders of Revelation. And there's so much to be learned and so much to study and so much to find God's grace and mercy in. But you know the people that really worry me? They're the people standing over at the windows and they're always looking out. They're never satisfied with what's in here. The people are looking out the windows. They're not going to be here very long, I can tell. There is a satisfaction that is born in the heart of the believer by the Spirit of God with what God has given us in His Word. You know those elderly saints of the Lord when they go to be with the Lord? I remember the elder, one of the elders in our church, it was an elder when I first visited there, had a very weak heart. and Brother Dave is his name. And, and I was with him in the last few hours of his life. And we were speaking with him about what, his, what is your comfort? What is your focus? What is your, your foundation at this time? And it was in the Word of God. And the approach of death itself could not shake that. That is a spirit-born activity. And I am concerned when I see men and women who are not satisfied with the voice of the shepherd. They're always looking for something else. I am not trying to say that the discussion of inerrancy can be just passed by in regards to alleged contradictions by just simply saying, well, it's just a spiritual thing. Look, I've met with enough Mormon missionaries who had a burning in their bosom to recognize the difference between the burning in the bosom of the Mormon missionary and what I'm talking about. They are not the same thing. I'm not talking about merely a subjective experience that just allows you to go, oh, well, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff now because I've received the testimony. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am saying is that we as creatures have spirits and minds and God addresses all of us. And I know some incredibly intelligent men who know more about the Bible than I will ever know who are atheists today. And I stand back and I look at that 
And I wonder, how can this be? And the only explanation I can find is a spiritual one. Their mind has not been opened. And what a great judgment for someone to have that kind of knowledge of the very speech of God and yet remain in spiritual darkness, unregenerate, an enemy of God. What a privilege if you hold the word of God and say, I believe. What grace and mercy has been shown to you in that context. So I simply emphasize the fact that this subject is not merely one of intellectual pursuit, debate, and dialogue. I believe, I have to believe because what I believe about man's nature, the depravity of man, the necessity of the Spirit of God in regeneration, that there is a spiritual element. Just as God had to open Lydia's heart to respond to the gospel, in the same way Christ promised that his sheep will hear his voice has something to do with the fact that in that same book, it is the Lord Jesus who talks about sanctifying them in the truth. Thy word is truth. We cannot divorce these things. And unfortunately, I think in many academic situations, we are told that we must. And may I just simply say in passing that I think part of this is due to the fact that there is... Seemingly an insatiable desire amongst many Christian scholars today to find acceptance in the unbelieving academy that reflects itself in an unwillingness to stand openly under the lordship of Christ in the entirety of your scholarship. May God forgive us that we do not first and foremost tell the world that what I do, I do as a servant of Christ and his church. And I do so under the lordship of Christ. What a witness we could have. And there have been so many who have done so. But I am truly concerned that so many today are concerned about what the world will think if we dare demonstrate that our scholarship is an exercise of being servants of Jesus Christ first and foremost. You see, the unregenerate man doesn't like that. The unregenerate man will not submit the entirety of his faculties to some external authority, especially to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've started preaching too much. I apologize, but let me move forward then. Most of you know, and this is why I have been concerned about this morning, there are many of you standing here who know exactly what's been going on for many years in regards to Dr. Enns and his teaching at Westminster Seminary. In 2005, Baker Academic published Dr. Peter Enns' book, Inspiration, Incarnation, Evangelicals, and the Problem of the Old Testament. Enns was, at that time, an associate professor at the Venerable Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Interestingly enough, in reviewing Enns' book, Dr. John Frame noted in passing Enns' like many evangelicals, wants to be invited to the table with the mainstream scholars. I think that's what I was just referring to. That does seem to be the case in this situation. This impetus is behind the gradual movement of, and let's be honest here, and this is why you need to be praying for your seminary leaders and praying for the next generation coming up. But history tells us which direction do theological institutions go. There seems to be a drag, a weight, like gravity, pulling theological institutions away from their grounds and away from the highest view of Scripture toward lesser things. It does seem to be that's the case with almost every theological institution unless God grants steadfastness or in some cases renewal, which he thankfully does. I certainly think there can be little doubt that Machen himself would have found end's work just a little bit more than troubling. Though we can only speculate about that, the governing board of Westminster Seminary likewise found his views inconsistent with the historical stance of the seminary. And though the faculty voted in support of ENDS, and I was talking with uh, someone who knows the ins and outs of this just a few moments ago, and there were some reasons for that. The board did not, and as of August 1st, 2008, Peter ENDS, quote, and I'm somewhat troubled by the way that this was phrased, quote, discontinued his service to Westminster Theological Seminary after 14 years, end quote. 
I'm not sure that that actually brought much closure. And the very fact that I've been asked to address the issues that he raised, I think, demonstrates that that did not exactly bring the type of closure that probably needs to be uh, obtained. I'd be interested in asking, how many of you have read Dr. N's book? Okay, only a small portion. Dr. Enns presents three areas of argumentation, all des designed to support his central thesis that we need to change our traditional ways of viewing Scripture and embrace what he calls the incarnational model. First, he presents a number of examples of parallels and relationships between literature and stories from the ancient world and the Christian Scriptures, raising the basic question, is the Bible unique? And if it's not, why do we call it the Word of God? What about the uniqueness of the Bible? Next, he raises questions concerning the Bible's internal consistency and integrity by addressing what he sees as, and this is a buzzword in the theological realm today, theological diversity. In the text of the Old Testament, primarily, that is his field. Then he deals with the always difficult and challenging area of the New Testament's use and interpretation of the Old Testament. Now that's anyone who is familiar with theological writing and inquiry over the past number of centuries is a broad, broad field of inquiry that clearly can only be touched upon lightly unless his book was 900 or 1,000 pages long, which it was not. A lot of material there, but likewise, it's the same areas, especially the last two, that are the focus of apologetic attacks upon the doctrine of inerrancy. That's where they are primarily focused. Some of the stuff uh, in the first section, which we'll look at, yeah, that, that comes up, but especially for the lay person. And Dr. N says, I'm concerned about the young person, the young student at Westminster Seminary who wants to consider himself uh, knowledgeable of these things. The answers we're giving are not really interacting properly with modern scholarship. That is the thesis that is expressed. It is important to grasp the position ENDS is promoting in this work. It's become, unfortunately, a common theme among those who find the old categories of speaking about inerrancy inadequate in our day. With his paradigm of seeing the Bible incarnationally, ENDS wishes to avoid the error of docetism. Now, biblical docetism, biblical docetism, what would that be? Well, the, the ancient term, the, the docetics, were those who denied that Jesus truly had a physical expression. In fact, you can see warnings against them in 1 John, who is the Antichrist, he who denies that Jesus has come in the flesh. The kind means it seems, and so the idea was that Jesus would be walking along the beach with the disciple, and the disciple turns around. There's only one set of footsteps, and it's not because Jesus was carrying the disciple, despite, <laughs> despite that prayer that you see in bathrooms all the time. Uh, that's not why it was. Uh, the reason that there's only one set of footprints is because Jesus doesn't leave footprints in the sand because he only seems to have a physical body. And so docetism was the idea that Jesus was basically a, a spiritual phantom that pretended to have a physical form. Obviously, it denies the incarnation, denies that Jesus was truly flesh, therefore it undercuts the entirety of atonement, uh, the entire Christian gospel. And the Apostle John identifies that concept as being part of the Antichrist and his attack upon the faith, their attack upon the faith, plural. Now, this is all well and good. The doctrine of the Incarnation, vitally important thing. But immediately upon hearing this kind of assertion, and it is found over and over and over again in Dr. N's book, you would think that there would have been included a rather extensive, extensive discussion of the whole doctrine of Incarnation. Not just a concern about docetism, but everything that incarnation means, because it doesn't just mean that Jesus truly had a physical nature, it also means that he truly had a divine nature. It guards against an entire range of theological error by guarding the central truth of who Jesus was, the Logos who became flesh and dwelt among us. 
The one who did not consider equality with the Father a thing to be grasped or held on to, but instead laid that aside, taking human nature. The Carmen Christi of Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You would think that would have been included. It was not. Instead, a certain rather narrow understanding of incarnation is used. And then, in essence, it becomes a drumbeat. The drumbeat being, we have to recognize the human element of Scripture. As if we've been ignoring that all along. As if people have not, in fact, been very carefully recognizing the fact that God has spoken in times past... And that means if what he said was to be understandable at all to the people to whom he was speaking, he has to speak their language. Let me give you an example that I developed years and years ago when I was engaged in dialogue and debate with an atheist in the Phoenix area, a very bright young man. tends to be where atheists come from. I think you start off as a bright young man, as an arrogant atheist, then you stay that way as you get older. Uh, simply out of pride uh, and, and refusal to recognize your own, your own created nature. But he raised an issue. The Old Testament law talks about animals that chew the cud. And it includes, amongst these animals, the rabbit or the hare. Now, I was a very odd person in college. I was a double major, single minor, biology, Bible, and Greek. Greek was the minor. And biology and Bible were my majors. And I could tell you some funny stories if I had more time about how those two ended up mixing together. The funniest one was after I was uh, showing our cadavers, which were chemically preserved and hence very smelly. Uh, I had a Greek class, and I forgot to take my smock off as I went into class. And my professor uh, was very kind to ask me to absent myself from the body of uh, students until I disposed of the rather odiferous garment. But uh, be that as it may, uh, I was a double major, and so I, I, I've studied biology. I was a department fellow in anatomy and physiology. And I know that the rabbit does not, by the 21st century standard of what chewing the cud is, chew the cud. There are certain organs that are involved with that and certain digestive processes. And, and so he said, see, the Bible is in error because it says that the rabbit does this and it doesn't. But have you ever watched a rabbit? I mean, have you ever just watched a rabbit? And I suppose someone living in New York City might buy all of this because you may have never seen one. But have you ever just watched a rabbit? Uh, I've gone rabbit hunting a few times. I watched it through a scope. <laughs> uh, and that was the last thing that rabbit ever did. But uh, uh, if you've ever watched a rabbit, now if any of you kids have little rabbits as pets, please do not throw things at me after the thing is over with. But... Uh, what does a rabbit do? It sits there and goes. Now, if you're trying to communicate something to people who live in a pre-modern time, what are you going to base that upon? Something they can't know for another two, three, four thousand years? Or something that's actually applicable to them? Just one of the many examples where you define biblical categories within the biblical context, not one way down the road. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying anything here that this is first year seminary stuff, or it should be anyways. I'm sure that it is. This is obvious thing. We, we, we recognize that we have to interpret the Bible in its original context, recognize these things. You know, we all know the rising and the setting of the sun stuff, and well, see, the Bible's there in error because it talks about the sunrise and the sun doesn't rise. And, you know, you just turn over your newspaper and it says, sunrise is when again? You know, and... <laughs> Those types of things are obvious to most of us. But there are principles that they point to. And one of the principles that they point to is a recognition of the human language in which God has condescended to express himself in. It has to have meaning to those to whom it is given. But this emphasis upon avoiding biblical docetism I believe in Dr. N's book, Becomes the Ends to the Mean. No pun intended there. It is, the, it is the goal to which we are moving to where it is the human aspect, and hence this issue, sense 
the writers of Scripture were ignorant of many things. And of course, even if Scripture were written today, would not the writers of Scripture be ignorant of many things? There is, it seems, an implicit arrogance amongst modern men about the ancient world that bothers me tremendously. I can't remember what I'm supposed to do tomorrow without my Blackberry. Something tells me people got along a whole lot better than I did in the past. But there is this arrogance, and the idea is, since the writers of Scripture were ignorant of these many things, then their ignorances must be allowed as errors in the text of Scripture. Unless you're a biblical docetist, and your Bible doesn't leave footprints in the sand. That seems to be the idea. But there's never any working out of the other side. How does this remain the very speech of God? How is it that this is the firm foundation, the very truth by which we are to be sanctified? And unfortunately, at that point, that's where you really start falling into some real quagmires in modern neo-Orthodox theology. Because once the foundations have collapsed... It's anybody's guess as to what you do with what is left over. You just got a bunch of bricks laying around, and one person goes over there and builds his kind of little house. Another person goes over there and builds his little kind of house. And you have all these different understandings. You don't have any foundation left for apologetics, theology, proclamation, or anything else. We should also note something else. The only way we know about the incarnation is by what? This has always made me scratch my head, even as a seminary student, because Dr. Enns didn't come up with the incarnational model. This has been being used for a long time. I had professors who talked about Scripture, and, you know, they loved Karl Barth, and, you know, Scripture becomes Scripture and encounter and all the rest of this stuff, and they loved the incarnational model as well, and, uh, you know, you have to recognize the human aspects and all, that, all the rest of that kind of stuff. But I remember asking one of my professors once, well, that's wonderful, but isn't the Incarnation like one of the highest level revelations of God? And in fact, if we don't have a sure word, why do we believe in the Incarnation? I mean, have you ever thought about it? The Incarnation is a rather radical thing. We're actually telling the world that the creator of all things entered into his own creation as a carpenter in Nazareth 2,000 years ago. Has anyone ever noticed that's a pretty radical claim? And radical claims sort of require a foundation upon which to be based. So I don't understand how, if we eventually adopt a view of Scripture that is, in essence, hobbled. It's a hobbled revelation due to the human aspect of things diminishing the trustworthiness of the text to communicate divine revelation. How do we know anything about the incarnation at all? And you know what that has led to in many instances? looking outside of Scripture for your sources of authority, hence to tradition, and hence has opened up a road for many right into Rome. Eastern Orthodoxy. A very, very popular direction for people to go these days, by the way. Not just Rome. So I have some problems with the very idea of saying, well, we can take a high-level revelation from God in Scripture, the Incarnation, turn that into a model for all of Scripture, And then on the basis of that, say, well, you know what? Um, Scripture contains man's ignorances, and we have to be very careful, and we have to be very uh, aware that we can't make the high claims that we have been making for a long time. But as time is passing me by, let me get to the specific examples uh, that Dr. Enns presents. And I'm not sure that I'm going to have time to get to all of them, but I'll try to get to at least some of the most important ones. Many of the examples that Dr. Enns provides come from ancient documentary sources that are generally not a part of the normal reading of most evangelicals. Uh, While I am not suggesting that every believer uh, should be poring over Pritchard's ancient Near Eastern text relating to the Old Testament, though it is very impressive on your bookshelf. Some of you haven't seen it, but it is. Trust me if you have it. Uh, It also uh, is excellent for stopping small arms fire if you're ever in that situation. (laughs) Not that I've ever trusted it on that. I'm just saying that I think it would stop most small arm fire. It is just as true that some reading in the context of the sources cited in such discussions is often 
very helpful. Endless similarities between, for example, the Enuma Elish story, also known as the Babylonian Genesis account, and the biblical account in Genesis. Specifically, these are the, the areas that he says, here's, here's a parallel that he provides between Enuma Elish and Genesis. One, the sequence of the days of creation is similar, including the creation of the firmament, dry land, luminaries, and humanity, followed by the rest. Two, Darkness precedes the creative acts. Three, there is division of the waters, waters above and the firmament below. Four, light exists before the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. On the basis of those similarities, Enns asks how we can speak of the biblical revelation as unique since it shares commonalities with other ancient works of literature and even with, and here comes that word, mythology. He writes, quote, both Genesis and the Enuma Elish breathe the same air, end quote. Now, let me just ask another probing question of everyone here. How many have ever read Enuma Elish? All right, what class is that for? <laughs> because you realize in the vast majority of audiences, everyone would have been going, what? Obviously, you have to read it for a class, and that's good. I'm glad that you do, because when you do, then you already know what I'm about to tell you. Do they breathe the same air? Thank you, Dr. Piper. I appreciate that commentary. That's the Piper ha-ha-ha commentary. I'm not leaving any question about where you stand on that one, are you? No, that's a good thing. Not if you read beyond surface level similarities, they don't breathe the same air. First, any discussion of origins, creation, will of necessity speak of earth and sky, luminaries, planets, etc. Any such discussion will have to have some order of creation, some discussion of light and darkness, etc. Such similarities are necessary given the very subject being addressed. But it is the dissimilarities that are the most important in answering N's question as to the uniqueness of the biblical narrative. For it is the foundational proclamation of the uniqueness of the creator in Genesis that separates Genesis from Enuma Elish or any other such ancient narrative. The God of the Bible is not a part of the pantheon of divine beings and hence dependent on preceding generations of gods. He is not taking pre-existing matter and reforming it into our current creation. God speaks and light and life come into existence. The creation is good. It's in its proper relationship with God. And the distinction between creator and creation is marked out clearly from the start. A brief review of the Enuma Elish reveals that it is firmly rooted in the bedrock of mythological polytheism. It is not the story of creation by a self-sufficient eternal creator who speaks and brings the physical creation into existence. Remember what it's about? It's the story of one god among many, Marduk, and his battle against his great-great-grandmother, Tiamat. Now, I don't know about you, but I have no interest in battling my great-great-grandmother. I don't think I'd be seen as much of a warrior if I did. There is no answer offered as to the origin of these many gods. Where did they come from? We're not told. The physical creation itself comes out of Marduk's defeat of Tiamat and the division of her body into various portions of the natural world. Now, one of N's parallels, that of light existing before the sun, moon, and stars, is not a parallel at all, since obviously all sorts of things in the realm of the gods exist prior to the division of Tiamat's body into the various parts of physical creation. Marduk has weapons to use in his fight with Tiamat. And obviously, they were probably not fighting in the darkness. So clearly, there is little relevant in observing this parallel, giving the fundamental difference between the accounts. And may I emphasize something here? This kind of, and I can only identify it as abuse, of ancient literature is not limited to this kind of argumentation. All the time today you will hear that the Jesus story is just simply cut out of the same cloth of the ancient mythologies. You know the easiest way to refute that? Read the ancient mythologies. The reason people get away with this is because we don't know 
the original source material. When you actually read it, you go, wait, 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 wait a minute. How can you see any parallel here when there is a fundamental, foundational, definitional difference at the very basic definition of the position? You have one creator God who is creating all things out of and into nothing over against a mythology that doesn't even attempt to explain the origin of all these gods or anything else. Can't you see the, the, the chasm that exists between these two? And yet, this is presented as being something that would be relevant to the uniqueness of the Bible. Other issues raised along these lines, and, and again, uh, the, the clock doth move. Along these lines, uh, secular documents relating to the law from the Hittites and from uh, the Gilgamesh epic and so on and so forth, are brought forward and said, see, there's great similarities between what the people of Israel had and what people around them had. How can the Bible therefore be unique? Now, from my perspective, those things that we have come to understand existed back then are great affirmations. First of all, how many in Old Testament studies today? And I, I know we have our Old Testament scholar right down front. But let's face it, as far as much of what's published today, we have given the Old Testament up to the liberals. I mean, just by the number of books that are, are, are public. And for the vast majority of those in seminaries across our land, what percentage would be teaching that Moses actually had anything to do with the Pentateuch at all? Zero percent? I was including you guys. You, you guys get a percentage point in there someplace. It's, a, it's okay. We have found Elijah, and he is alone. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few others outside of Greenville. Trust me, we're still out there. It's okay. But, uh, but we're in the vast minority. We, we will admit we're in the vast minority. They even think that there was a Moses or they had anything to do with the Pentateuch or that we can push it back all the way as far as we do. That is a minority position anymore in most of Old Testament studies. And yet I sit here and I read this book and I go, well, wait a minute, why are you comparing this to these ancient, ancient documents when you don't actually believe that the Pentateuch is an ancient, ancient document itself? It seems to me to be a rather confirming evidence that if God is who God says he is, and if God creates man in his image, that there would be, by simple common grace, certain common elements in man's law. It's written upon the heart. And so all this tells us is that from the time man started writing things down, there has been in the witness of his heart this representation which we see in its fullness in God's word. Why is that in anything, in any way, shape, or form anything but a confirmatory evidence? I don't understand. The uniqueness of that law is not that it gives law to men, but that in giving its law to men, it represents the one true God of history that is involved in glorifying himself through that people. That's where its uniqueness comes from. But again, I have been preaching way too much and haven't even gotten to the second area that is presented here. The next area that is, that is presented has to do with the use of of the Old Testament in the New. And in five minutes, I can hardly uh, uh, summarize the whole discussion of uh, the synoptic problem, Old Testament interpretation by New Testament writers and all the rest of these things. But what I can say is this. It strikes me that there is a lot of literature. Have you noticed before each presentation? In fact, you know, have you ever, have you made sure that you count the number of books you put under here so that you know that whether the, uh, the speaker has sort of stuck it under his Kindle? Um, but uh, you've had books recommended to you in each session. And there's an entire bookstore back there that you can go to. And it bothers me to no end that so many people would say, well, you know, we just haven't really been interacting with modern biblical scholarship the way we need to. That seems to become a buzzword for saying we need to adopt that paradigm to actually be interacting with it properly. Now, I'm not saying that there are not real conservative people who try to create a cocoon and, and say we just need to ignore what's going on out there and just focus upon... That's a danger. I admit that that's a danger. But you know what? My experience is it's not our side that ignores what they have to say. 
It's them that ignore what we have to say. There is a lot of material interacting with these issues. There's a lot of excellent books on the synoptic problems. There's a lot of, of tremendously in-depth discussion and wrestling with, because look, Hebrews, you've got to deal with the New Testament use of the Old Testament when you preach through Hebrews. That's tough material. But there's all sorts of discussions of it. Why pretend that to believe in inerrancy means that you have just ignored these things? Unless your overarching assertion is that if you're really dealing with modern biblical scholarship, you have to accept their conclusions that the biblical writers were in essence abusing their own text. That there is no unifying biblical revelation. That seems to be what's going on in many of these situations. That seems to be what's going on here as well. And so discussions about synoptic problems, uh, there was <laughs> one interesting one was, well, how many times did Jesus cleanse the temple? All right, that's a question that has to be answered, has to be discussed. What was interesting is I listened to Dr. Enns after he left Westminster. I wasn't able to listen to a lot of things. I, I, again, I, I try to sort of scour the Internet and, and listen to what people have to say. And before I wrote an article on this subject for the CRI Journal uh, last year, which undoubtedly is what got me into trouble here uh, in the first place, uh, I listened to an appearance that Dr. Enns made on uh, NPR, on the Philadelphia uh, NPR station. And I was a little bit taken aback by what I heard on a number of issues. But one of the statements, and it's repeated in the book, is in talking about the cleansing of the temple, Dr. N said, it is, quote, distortion of the highest order to argue that Jesus must have cleansed the temple twice, end quote. Yet, he does not note, as Dr. Beale has rightly pointed out, that there's an entire list of men that Dr. Enns has now said are guilty of such distortion of the highest order, such as A. Plummer, B. F. Westcott, R. V. G. Tasker, R. G. R. G. Grunler, Leon Morris, and D. A. Carson. Likewise, Craig Blomberg and A. Kustenberger lean toward two cleansings as well. So how many books does that represent of people who have actually meaningfully engaged this particular issue? A whole bunch of them. So why pretend that there is no interaction going on when there is interaction going on on a broad basis? So often in the rhetoric of the current controversies, any treatment of the ancient documents that gives them the benefit of the doubt and seeks harmony between them is dismissed out of hand as being contrived. Yet is it not far more probable that when it comes to apparent conflicts regarding statements of fact, we position thousands of years later might just be missing some basic pieces of the contextual puzzle that were quite apparent to the original authors, and therefore, if we have any humility whatsoever, we should honor them as knowing what they're talking about rather than automatically assuming that we know better than they? I'm reminded of a story about a terrible incident that took place somewhere around the beginning of the 20th century, as I recall, young black man was lynched. And when they began to investigate the crime, they found that the witnesses were hopelessly in contradiction with one another as to where the event took place. Reliable eyewitnesses said it took place here, and just as reliable eyewitnesses said, but I saw it here. And it was not until they discovered that there was photographic evidence, which is a rather modern invention, that they were able to discover that no one had been lying. The lynching had taken place in one location, and then the man had been moved to another and rehung. But if they had never had the photographic evidence, they could never have made heads or tails. And what would have been the conclusion of many people today? Somebody was lying. Somebody was not telling the truth. And the reality was, everybody had been telling the truth. We just needed to have the kind of information that would give us that kind of background. 
And ever since I've read of that story, I have realized how very valuable it is in our context today. That is, many of the accusations that are made against the text of Scripture come from this modern hubris that says, we know enough to convict the ancient writers of error in this matter, in this matter, in this matter. Now, if we're talking about a statement of X and not X, okay, fine. But in so many instances, there is just an overriding desire to find error and to create tension. Some of it, I'll be perfectly honest with you, is created by the way we do scholarship. What do I, what do I mean by that? You have to come up with something new to get published. You've got to come up with something new. Folks, when it comes to Christian theology and the Christian faith, something new is normally heretical. That's not to say that there's not a tremendous amount of study that still needs to be done in the Word of God. I had a friend, I was, I was asking a friend about that wonderful text in Romans 4, 8, about the blessedness of the man to whom God will not impute sin. I asked him, he's a Greek scholar, and we can ask our Greek scholars here. Do you know of any in-depth studies as to all the uses of this particular form in the original language cited from the Septuagint in the New Testament? And he said, no, but that would be a great dissertation. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And I hope that there are young men sitting right here that will be driven to do that kind of work. There's more that needs to be done. But unfortunately, when it comes to theology, to be new, to be fresh is often to be heretical. And that's what catches the ear, that's what catches the eyes of the publisher, so on and so forth. There is a modern arrogance. Let me summarize, since time has passed me by. We have, in our day, a tremendous amount of pressure being placed upon our theological institutions, our schools, our students, our pastors, our scholars, to adopt a mindset and a worldview that is fundamentally contradictory to the worldview that flows from the sacred scriptures, the worldview exemplified by great men of God of the past who have charted the course for us. And we have a choice to make. Dr. Enns came to a conclusion that the scriptures are not docetic. Well, that's good. But unfortunately, he only came to that conclusion on one side of the equation. And I think one of the greatest dangers of his book, and I'm not someone who says, oh, yeah, make sure not to read that now. You might, be, you know, might, you might, might get, get messed up. I have to read all sorts of garbage. I read it so you don't have to. I wasn't referring to that. I was talking about Muslims and all the rest of that stuff. But my real concern is that he says in his book, my concern is for the young people who need to know that they can still believe the Bible is the word of God. And that's a noble sentiment. Would be that more people were concerned. But in my opinion, at the end of the day, he didn't answer his own objections. It is not a consistent position to say to people, you can continue believing that the Bible is the word of God, however, you can't really be certain as to what it's saying is actually true. How does that ground someone? How does that encourage someone? I don't understand it. Instead, May I suggest something? That even though it is so unpopular today, the quest to an obedience to God and honor of his word, to answer the difficult questions, the quest to understand the backgrounds, the quest to find not a surface level harmony, but that deep harmony on the level of the themes and the sovereignty of God in glorifying himself all the way through history, finding that kind of divine harmony is one of the highest callings 
that anyone could ever have. And I can tell you, and I can only tell you this, I cannot transfer this to you. Some of you have been serving the Lord for many more decades than I have. But I've finally gotten to the point where I've got enough decades behind me and enough battle experience to where I can look you in the eye and say that there is a glorious harmony in God's Word. And I say that having debated atheists and Muslims, Mormons and liberals, and they've pushed me many times into the text and pushed me deeper into the text. And I'm not claiming to have an answer for everything. But you know what? When someone proves himself to be trustworthy and faithful over and over again, eventually you get the idea. God has proven himself to be faithful. And his word has proven to be faithful over and over again. That's my testimony to you. Thank you very much.